And then there's a companion passage, and we're just beginning in this. We'll, we'll take maybe two, maybe three weeks, and then um, we'll finish this, and then I'm going to go back into the book of Acts again, which you've left for, for quite some time. But I want us to look at what uh, Peter says about humbling ourselves, because throughout the Bible, if almost always, if there's something about fasting, it is connected with humbling. It's connected with, with humbling. And a lot of us have wrong ideas or misunderstandings about humbling ourselves. We tend to think that it means I'm nobody, I'm bad, I'm this, I'm that, I'm nothing, or I'm this. That is not at all what the Bible means when it talks about humbling. Not at all. Not at all. It also has nothing to do with personality. You know, some people are shy or very quiet, and we think, oh, they're really humble. It has nothing to do with personality, brothers and sisters. It has to do with that inner, with that inner part of us and the, the, spirit, the spirit part of us. And it has to do with the soul as well, that, that will that we have. But it ha so humbling... Humbling ourselves. We're going to look this morning at a passage in the context of this last week of fasting and prayer. Let's see what Peter says and James says about fasting and prayer this morning. But we're going to stay mostly in uh, 1 Peter. So here we have it. It's in 1 Peter 5. And if you want to uh, do a little more reading on your own this week, I'm going to say take a little more time and read in James 4. So you can find the passage because you're really smart. Um, James 4. 1 Peter 5, so chapter 4, chapter 5. And then there's some other ones as well. And it's interesting to me because you're going to see as we look this morning, I told you, and I, I'm speaking quickly this morning, you're going to see that James and Peter, we're going to stay mostly in Peter, but they say almost exactly the same thing. In fact, some of the verses, the one verse that James says, Peter says exactly the same verse. Wait a minute, God uh, just pay attention, Lord, you, you repeated yourself here. And God says, uh-huh, I repeated myself. I want you to get it. I want you to pay attention. And James begins in the same way that Peter does. Let's look at this. Uh, he says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because, then he quotes an Old Testament verse, and this is the verse that's in both passages, James and Peter. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Exactly the same words, exactly the same verse that James also writes about. God, the Holy Spirit, inspires two men to write exactly the same thing to us, to us this morning. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And one of the things that fasting does is it humbles us, doesn't it? It humbles us. Now, other things as well, other things as well that we'll look at in these two or three weeks. But so gives grace to the humble. And then Peter says... Oh, and I'm so glad it's Peter that says it, because honestly, folks, of all of the disciples of Jesus, if we were to pick out one that had a problem with being humble, who would we pick? Of course we'd pick Peter. Of course we'd pick Peter. Peter thought he was the cat's pajamas, or the cat's meow, or the cat's whiskers, or you say, what? It's an American thing. Peter thought he was number one. In fact, he really had a hard time later on when Jesus seemed to show favor to one. Remember that? And Peter said, what about him, Lord, or whatever? And Jesus said, none of your business. Peter struggled with this, this whole thing mm, all of his early years. And that encourages me because you know what? Here was a guy that was discipled face to face by Jesus himself for almost three years. And he still, he struggled with these things. So it gives me hope for myself. But what gives me hope also is that later, as the Holy Spirit has come to live in him and work in him, Peter can now, with sincerity and without hypocrisy, write about being humble and even saying, clothe yourselves with humility. And that clothe yourself, it means to put on an apron like a servant. That's exactly, really, that's what it means, brothers and sisters. Put on an apron like a servant. Surely in Peter's minds was that night before Jesus went to the cross when oh his beloved master Jesus took off, took out his outer, took off his outer garment rolled up his sleeves put on an apron and his own master humbled himself as a servant and washed Peter's feet remember Peter's response no 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 not me lord 
false humility, which is pride, false humility. Surely Peter was remembering that. As Peter now says, clothe yourself with humility for one another. I think that must have been in his mind as he said that. And so it, it encourages me that he then says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him before, because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Mmm, I wonder what type of Christian the enemy devours. I don't think it's the humble Christian. Mmm, resist him, standing firm in the faith. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Here's this wonderful, wonderful passage. So much here. We're not going to go into all of it by any means. We're going to highlight a few things, specifically in the context of fasting and, and humbling ourselves. And as we look at this and as we think about this, when we build a good foundation in our lives, and I want to tell you, if you took the time to fast and pray in some manner, in whatever manner, this last, this last week, or whenever you do, you are building a foundation in your Christian life, a good foundation in your Christian life. It may not feel like it right now, but you're building a good foundation. How many of you know, especially you engineers, especially those of you that are, that, that are uh, architects or whatever, like Alistair or others, how many of you know that sometimes the longest, the, the longest part, the hardest work, it's the foundation, isn't it? It's the foundation because everything's going to rest on that. Everything's going to be on that. You're, you're building a good foundation. You're building a good foundation. When you take time, when you build a good foundation through prayer, through fasting, through getting into the Word, through real fellowship with other believers, I don't mean come in, hi, and at the end of the meeting, bye. That's, that's not, hey, brothers and sisters, that's not real fellowship. That's not real fellowship. You know that. You know that. It's not real fellowship. Get into fellowship in small groups or in other ways. Um, that's real fellowship. That helps to build a foundation in our lives. When there's quick obedience, quick repentance, we can be confident, we can be confident that we will walk in victory even when we walk through hard times. We can be assured of His grace extended to us. And you're going to see that this morning. I, I guarantee you, I give you a promise this morning. It's, I proclaim over you. If you have followed the Lord this week in diligence and humbled yourself before Him in fasting and prayer, God, you're going to have grace in your life that you have not had before this week. You are. You say, how can you say that, Pastor Jennifer? How do you know that? Because God says it. Because God says it. And if God says it, your pastor can say it. Your pastor can say it as well. Grace is given. Extra grace is given. In this year that comes up, uh, next slide, we're going to face some obstacles. Let's look at some of the things that we're going to face. You say, when I gen Pastor Jennifer, you got us up on a high point, the grace. And now you're talking about the low point. There's going to be anxiety in this upcoming year. You're going to have to, hey, you're going to have to face the devil this year. Your enemy, the devil, is prowling around. Okay? So the devil's going to be there. Is, what else is there going to be? What's that word down there that we never like? Okay, we've suffered. There's going to be suffering this year. These things are, because they are part of human, our human existence, the Lord does not magically pluck us out of the world and set us on a mountaintop with him to wait like in like nirvana until Jesus comes and whatever. He, 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 we fight these things. We face these things. Every one of these things. And I want to tell you right now, if and when you face these things these years, don't let the enemy condemn you. You haven't failed. You haven't fallen short. You're not a bad Christian. You haven't prayed hard enough and, 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 and things like that. Although there are times when we should pray more than we're praying. It is part of our lives, and that is, part, that is part of it. But here's the encouragement this morning. In the context of fasting and prayer and humbling ourselves, this passage, next slide, also says what? He gives grace to the humble. So you are, as we come to the Lord in this way and humble ourselves under Him, He's going to give us grace and 
James, in the passage in James, it says, but he gives us more grace. I love that. And a little bit later, oh, I love this verse 10. Look at verse 10. It says, and the God of what? All grace. Wow. We don't use that as a title for the Lord very much, but isn't that a wonderful title for our Lord? The God of all grace. You think God's going to keep all that grace for himself? God shares his grace with his children. He shares his grace. So we're going to have grace. What else is he going to do? He's going to lift us up in due time. Re James says, okay, you're resisting the devil. James, James says almost exactly the same thing. And what does he say? And he will flee. He's going to flee from you this year. He's going to flee from you. And I love this, this last part that, that concludes this passage in Peter. It says, he will himself. And some translations say he will personally. I love that even more. I love that, that thought and that idea that the Lord personally comes to you and restores you. What's he going to do? Restore, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but I know about me. This is how I want to live this year. Don't you want to live that way this year? Yes. Don't you want extra grace of God poured out in your lives? Don't you want to, as you resist the devil, you want the devil to flee from you this year? I do. I don't want him camping around my door, roaring, scaring me. I, I really mean that. I want him to flee from me. I want to be restored in the Lord. I, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking quickly and I'm, I'm laughing and smiling with you. I, I mean this, brothers and sisters. Is this the life we want to live this year? Yes, we do. Well, three of us are going to live like, Pastor Renee, we, you and I and a few others, we're, we're going to live like this this year. But the encouragement, brothers and sisters, is this, that the Lord, as we, as we respond to Him and as we um, apply His Word to our lives in obedience and put into practice these things, this is His promise to you this year, brothers and sisters. It, it, is, his, it is His guarantee. It's His Word. It's His Word to you. And that's how I want to live. That's how I want to live. I want to come to the end of, of 2018 and say, Oh Lord, thank you so much for your grace poured out in my life. Thank you that you've restored me, made me strong, firm, and steadfast. Thank you, O oh Lord, that you've lifted me up and that the devil has fled from me in this year. That, that's what I want my testimony. That's what I want the words to be that come from my mouth. And I know you do as well. As well. I'm not preaching something empty to you this morning. I'm preaching to you the truth of the Word of God and the promises of God. How does this become part of our lives then? How does this become our testimony, brothers and sisters? It sounds great, doesn't it? Yes? Yes, yes it sounds great. Well, that's great. How is it going to be part of our lives? God shows us how. He doesn't leave us in doubt. He doesn't make it, make it a mystery so we kind of wander through. And I hope sometime, somehow, some way, I'm a victorious Christian this year. He makes it very, very clear to us. And as we look at this passage in 1 Peter and in James 4, we see, among many other things, among many other Christian disciplines, something that I believe is a key to a victorious life. I really believe this. An overcoming life this year with all these things that we've, that we, that we've read. And I believe we see it here. Uh, let's look at the next slide at some of the, at, at, at these two passages. Next slide, slide five. From 1 Peter and from James, look with me. Both passages, how do they get, begin? Read with me both the beginning of both passages. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Okay, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You see what Peter says? So he says, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand. James puts it a little bit differently. We'll get into this next week. He uses a slightly different word with a special meaning. He says, submit. What does that word really mean? Does it mean to bow our head? It actually, it, it has to do with obedience. Did you know that? It has to do with obedience. We'll talk about that. We won't get to it today, but submit yourselves then to God. And then he says, Basically the same thing Peter says. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he'll lift you up. And so I, as we look at this from 1 Peter 5, James 4, there's so much good here. I truly encourage you in your Bible reading. Go back and chew on that and meditate on that this week and let the Lord make this real to your life. Sink it, let it sink down in your heart so that you're living this way in this year. That the, the key is to humble ourselves. One of the keys, one of the foundations is that we humble ourselves before the Lord. How? What does that mean? This is what we're looking at. Um, 
Humble yourselves before the Lord. He'll lift you up. He opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Why is this so important? Why is it so important to God that two times in, in a very close place in the New Testament, he says he inspires the writers to say exactly the same thing? Do you think he missed it? Do you think, oh, 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 fooey. The Bible's already been printed, and James said it, and Peter said the same thing. Oh, but too late. It's already printed. You think God said that? I, I'm not trying to make light, but I, I, want you to, I want us to get it this morning. Of course not. Of course not. Brothers and sisters, God designed it and planned it. Why is it so important to God that we know and take in that he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble, and that we humble ourselves under him. Why is it so important? Because the opposite of being humble is being proud. What made Lucifer into Satan? Pride. What made Adam and Eve say that fruit looks good and I'm going to eat it? Even though God, who made me and loves me and has given me everything, said, don't eat it. Pride. It was pride. It was pride. Why is it so important to God that his children get this and understand it and make it part of our Christian lives and part of our Christian discipline? Because the opposite of it brings death into our lives. There's no way to... Listen, there's no way to walk closely with the Lord if we're walking in pride. There's no way. There's no way. And as I said at the beginning, it has nothing to do with personality. Nothing. We look at some people that are quiet and meek and we think, oh, they're very humble. Uh-uh. At times there may be people that look so humble and so whatever. And, and it may be a very, it may be a, I'm not saying it is, but it, you don't know what's on the inside. Don't, we don't judge by personality. You don't judge by personality. God looks on the heart. God looks on the heart. And you say, you mean me too? Yes, you too. And me too. And me too. Why? Because my father used to be, not anymore, but my father used to be Satan. Used to be Satan. You say, oh, well, he used to be your father too. Don't get shocked. He used to be your father too. And I believe Satan forever, forever comes back to us in this area because it was, it's his number one thing. Pride, pride, pride. And so God works in us, in his children, the exact opposite thing, which is to be humble, which is to be humble. He opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I want you to think about that word for just a minute, and then I want to give you an example. God opposes the proud. Opposes is really a strong word, isn't it? It doesn't just mean, oh, I don't like it. It's a strong word. It's a fighting word. Oppose. Now, I don't know about you, but me... I'm fighting enough things in my life. I don't want to be in a fight with God. You want to be in a fight with God? God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And as I was, re as I was preparing yesterday and I was thinking about this, I, re I um, remembered a game that I used to play on the playground. And at other times as well, even as I grow up, some of you are smiling because you already know what it is. There'd be a long rope. And sometimes there were knots in the rope, maybe a knot at each end. And on the playground, we would divide into two groups. I was always on the losing side. <laughs> I think maybe it was because of me. I wasn't particularly strong. And we'd get onto two sides, and there'd be a line in the middle, or sometimes, if you're at camp or something like that, they'd make a big mud pit in the middle so that if your team lost, you know what happens next, right? You'd start pulling tug of war or tug of war. All of us have played that, right? Has anybody not played that before? Not played tug of war? You've missed it if you've never. All of us have played tug of war. That's what I thought of yesterday. That's what I thought of yesterday. So it's, it's a little bit like this. You want to get in a tug of war with God? He's on the other end of the rope and you're pulling against him? God always wins, brothers and sisters. You're going to get pulled into the mud pit. 
<laughs> You're gonna, if you know what I mean. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But that's a strong word, and I want you to see it as a strong word. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I don't want to be in a fight with God this year. I really don't. And I know you don't either. We want, don't you want extra grace in your life? Do, do you want extra grace in your life? Well, see, I do too. I want extra grace in my life as well. How do we win? We win by submitting. How do we win? We win by humbling ourselves. But how and where and to whom is key. We overcome by humbling ourselves under God's mighty hand. James says, submit yourselves to God. Humble, humble yourselves before the Lord. Now, as we think about that, about humbling ourselves, some of you right now are saying, oops, I didn't fast and pray this last week. This message is not for me. Yes, it is. Because guess what? You've got uh, 11 and a half more months ahead of you in which to fast and pray and wait on the Lord. But there are other things to do with fasting and prayer as well. So I don't want to make light of that. But I am going to encourage you to, as you start seeing and reaping the benefits of fasting and prayer in this past week, to come to the Lord in all honesty and say, okay, Lord, help me to incorporate more seasons of fasting and prayer in my life this year, whether it's weekly or monthly, in whatever way. It may not be a seven-day fast again. It may be a different type of fast, but I challenge you, and I encourage you, and I'm going to come back to this throughout the year. I know the Lord is speaking to me about this as well, because I'm beginning to see already the benefits. It was a tough week for me. It may have been a tough week for you too, but I praise the Lord. I'm beginning to see already some of the blessings of humbling myself before the Lord and receiving extra grace. And so, I want to ask you something. Did I call any of you, did Pastor Renee call any of you this week to find out, um, to find out how you did, that some of you, you broke your fast by snacks and chips. You ate a piece of cake this week. Jocelyn, did you eat a piece of cake this week? No, we didn't call any of you, did we? Do you know why we didn't? Because fasting is voluntary. Not only is fasting voluntary, Fasting is a choice. Let me tell you what else is related to this. Humbling ourselves is also a choice. It's a choice. Let's look at some verses. Slide six. Let's look at some of them. David says, I humbled myself with fasting and my prayer was genuine. Ezra, who was taking the, the people back from Babylon and he was taking them back to Jerusalem and he was going to have to go through a dangerous area. And there by the Ahava Canal, I proclaimed a fast to humble ourselves before our God. Matthew 18, 4, Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of God. Matthew 23, 12, Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And then the two verses in James and Peter, Humble yourselves, therefore... James also says, humble yourselves. So you see the connection this morning? Do we see the connection? Who humbles us? Who humbles us? We, me, I, I humble myself before the Lord. I choose. I choose. Honestly, brothers and sisters, I believe as I've lived my Christian life and as I see the Word of God, the best things of God, the greatest things of God, the blessings of God, the greatest graces of God in our lives will come when we choose God. When we choose God. God will always let us choose less if that is what we want. But He has given us, oh, our wonderful Lord and Savior. He has given us choice. He has not taken that away from us. And we choose. We choose. And when we choose, and we choose in the right way, and we choose in His way, and we choose what honors Him, He honors us. He honors us. And He gives us extra grace. He gives us extra blessing. I promise you that because it's God's promise this morning. And so we choose. We choose. I'm going to go just a few more minutes this morning. Then we're going to stop. But as we come to a close this morning. So to whom do we humble ourselves? Okay, you say, Pastor Jennifer, that's a no-brainer. We humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. That's true. We do. We submit to Him. But I want to stress that. And I want you to see that because often we get in tough situations. We hear something like this. 
and we're going through maybe a physical battle, a health battle, or a financial battle, or a tough boss, or a tough work, and, and in effect, we, get, we sort of give up. And we think that that means I'm humbling myself. That is not what this passage means, brothers and sisters. You don't humble yourself. You don't give yourself up to wicked, evil, wrong situations. It's very, very clear. We humble ourselves before God. We give up to God. We give up to God. That's the only way to live victoriously when you're going through hard times. Because if you give up to the hard thing, the hard person, the hard this or the hard that, then you're going to be in despair, you're going to be depressed, and you're going to, be, you're, you're going to get down. So what you have to do is say, God, I humble myself to you in this. Lord, I don't understand what you're doing. God, I whatever. But Lord, I, I set my eyes on you and I humble myself to you. We give in to God. And then, as we, this is the closing point this morning. And we'll, we'll only do part of it, and then we'll come back to this. This is where we'll pick up again. But I want you to stay with me here. Peter says, and I like it, he says, Humble yourselves where? Under God's mighty hand. Now, some of us don't like the way that sounds, because when we think of it, it seems a little bit more, God's hand is mighty, right? It's big, it's strong, it's powerful. And we have the earthly idea of this big hand pushing us and pressing us down. Now there is some pressure at times and we're going to talk about that next week but not this week. But we get the human idea and the best example I can give you is this from my cousins. When after we left Singapore and gone back to the States we would often go to my cousin to my dad's oldest brother uh, and he was a real farmer. Cows, pigs, chicken, big, big farm. Tomatoes, cotton, peanuts, uh, watermelon, and things like that. And during harvest seasons um, that were hand-picked, watermelons are hand-picked, tomatoes are hand-picked. You don't believe it by looking at me standing here in the pulpit, but uh, my, my parents, who thought it was good for us, and it was, would ship us down to my aunt and uncles in Florida, and we would help with the tomato harvest and the watermelon harvest all week long, two weeks or whatever. It was hard work. And we would get together, but we loved it. We were with our cousins. They had five kids. And in those five out of those five kids, there were three boys. There were three brothers. And these guys, oh, I loved them. And one was almost exactly my same age. We all loved each other. But these guys, I mean, they were farm boys, okay? They really, they were farm boys. They worked hard when they worked. And when they played, they played hard, too. <laughs> They really did. They were athletes. They were in all sorts of sports teams. They did so well. They had muscles. They were this and that. And, and, and they were pretty competitive, too. And they'd play together and they'd hunt together or whatever. And sometimes they'd wrestle each other as well. And sometimes things would kind of start out playing and then they'd get a little bit rough at times. I think it's a guy thing. I'm not sure. I think it's, it's a guy. As we always say, it's fun until somebody gets hurt. Right? That's what we say. And they would, I would be down there sometimes and I'd think, ah! but that's what they did. One, one brother would get on top of another and they'd start wrestling. And the one that would, that would have the upper hand, he'd start pushing the, uh, his other brother down. And he might start rubbing his head or doing this or doing things like that. And there was no blood. There was no <laughs> blood. But, but, but there, was pre there was pressure. And he would say, in American speak, he would say, say uncle. Say uncle. Uh, Steve said in the UK, what you say instead is, do you give up? So elegant. You know, we Americans, <laughs> so elegant, do you give up? A, a complete, a nice complete sentence. <laughs> and we say, say uncle. So that, but that's what Americans say, say uncle. And the other brother that would be underneath, he'd go, no! Oh, and he'd struggle and he'd whatever and sometimes he'd overcome the other brother and then he'd be on top and then he'd be doing it. he'd say, say uncle, say uncle. And it wouldn't stop until somebody said, uncle. <laughs> somebody had to say uncle. That was the only way it stopped. And the parents let it go on because they knew that, you know, nobody's going to die and nobody whatever and, and whatever. And what I want to say is this. We... We sometimes think of God's hand as that way. We, we really do. And I gave you that very vivid example. And I know we laughed about it. But honestly, brothers and sisters, that's how we think about God sometimes. We almost think of God's hand as kind of pushing us down in the dirt and the mud and the dust. And it's almost like, say uncle, say uncle, say uncle. And what I want to say to you is, God doesn't do that. That 
is not God's hand. That is not God's mighty hand. Could he do it? Of course he could do it. Remember in the Old Testament when Jacob wrestled with a man and that man was God. It was God. And basically, anyhow, wrestling together all night long, all night long. Let me ask you something. Could God, in human form, as he wrestled with Jacob, could God not have just like that, and Jacob would have been down in the dust and the dirt saying, uncle, 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 uncle? <laughs> of course he could have. Brothers and sisters, God could do that to you and me as well. He could, but he never does that. Why? He wants us to choose. God wants people who will choose him. That's where his greatest blessings come. That's where his greatest blessings come. God won't make you do anything. He won't make me either. But he gives us a choice. He gives us a choice. They kept wrestling and Jacob kept wrestling with him. And the man looked at Jacob as daylight was coming. And he said, God, in human form, and he said, let me go. Let me go. Daylight is coming. I must go. And Jacob says, no. No, no, I won't let you go. Jacob had not submitted all night long, wrestling with God. It was his choice. God could have humbled him, but he did not. He did not until finally. And then God, in human form, touched him, broke that part, and then he said, what is your name? And Jacob had to say, Jacob, I'm a deceiver. I'm a liar. I'm a cheat. I've cheated my brother. That's, what it, well, that's all it was meant. All of those things were meant in that word. And I love that. I love that. Because what God, what God in that human form was doing and was saying in effect, you're not going to humble yourself. I'm leaving. That's what he was saying. Oh, brothers and sisters, will we not humble ourselves before God that he might stay with us. I'm not talking about losing your salvation. Please understand that this morning. But it is his manifest presence with us. It is his walking with us in intimacy and closeness and fellowship that will only come to the person that says, I humble myself before you, God. I walk with you in humility. I will not walk in my own pride. I humble myself before you. And of that person, and of that choice, God says, I'm not leaving you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to walk with you. Oh, brothers and sisters, the joys, the blessings, the riches of humbling ourselves under God's mighty hand. No other way. No other way. No other way. As we go into this new year, I urge you, as you put yourself under God's mighty hand, we're going to talk more about this, and you say, well, I want to know more. I want to understand more. How? What does it mean? We're going to talk about it. But the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart as well. Oh, this is what we want. Oh, I tell you, those of you who know me say, you don't have to tell me, I already know. I am so strong. I'm so strong. I don't mean in the Lord. I am so strong. And a lot of us are strong. Oh, God. Oh, God. I won't let you go until you bless me. And this is who I am. I want the presence of the Lord. I want His grace poured out in my life in this year. I invite you to close your eyes. Isn't that what you want? I believe it is. Would you tell the Lord that as we close? I know I've gone over this morning and I appreciate your patience this morning, but take, just don't look at your watches for just a minute. Just, would you talk to the Lord? Would you tell him that this morning if that's your desire? If you say, Pastor, I blew it this week because I said, I ain't gonna fast and pray. I don't want to. Not too late, not too late to come to the Lord and still say, God, I, 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 made, I made not such a great choice. Lord, I, I, I do come to you. Oh, Lord, we come to you. 
we have wrestled with you, some of us, a long, long time. But Lord, we want to say we won't let you go till you bless us. Bring us to the place of blessing and we choose and we humble ourselves before you. God, we want your grace, extra grace, the God of all grace, to pour out your grace in our lives. Lord, we want to, the devil to flee from us. We want you personally to make us steadfast, make us firm and strong. Lord, we want our anxieties and cares cast upon you this year rather than being proud enough to think, I've got to figure this out. Lord, help us us this year individually and as a church that we humble ourselves before you under your mighty hand and that at the right time you will raise us up you will raise us up hallelujah lord because when you raise us up and when you pick us up nobody no thing no situation no devil is going to put us down because you've raised us up oh lord oh lord but until you do Lord, we humble ourselves under your mighty hand. Show us how we may continue to do that day by day in our lives. We choose you again. Oh, we want your presence, your manifest presence with us this day, tomorrow, throughout this, this year. Oh, Lord, in your name we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.